I thought the three of us doing it together. That's oh, no, what Bill no. said. We, we'll delegate. No, we will do it together. <laughs> no, we're, I'm in. Tom is in. We're in. We're, we're in. Yes. Yeah. He's our communication wing. The most yeah. important thing. Why did someone think that was a good idea? Yeah, was it I mean, because... Like, because of the model we had. TikTok videos of, you know, some kid taking um, goo the, out of the a slime. can. And slime and playing with it. Hello and welcome to the stream, an unscripted, unedited, free-flowing conversation featuring guests who reject the status quo with a bias for action in the world of water and beyond. My name is Tom Freyberg. I'm an environmental journalist and content creator specializing in water. And I'm Will Sarney, a water strategy consultant doing my part to solve wicked water problems. And today we are thrilled to be joined by friend, colleague, partner, uh, Professor Nusha uh, Ajami, who is the Chief Strategic Development Officer for Research at Berkeley Lab. Nusha, great to see you and welcome and thanks for joining the stream. How are you? Good, hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. Very good, very good. Thanks, uh, great to see you. And uh, we, we would say happy World Water Day, although it was yesterday. So happy belated, belated, belated World Water Day. And when this goes out, it'll be a week afterwards, but that doesn't matter. We can still reflect and discuss. How was it, how was it for you yesterday? It was great. We actually, I actually, uh, I don't know if you know, but I sit on San Francisco Public Utilities Commission as a commissioner and we had our commission meeting yesterday. So very appropriate for being a World Water Day. So event, the I guess. The question was, was it a happy meeting? Because everyone always talks about happy World Water Day, <sighs> right? That's a good question. Sure, it was happy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was productive. I would use the word productive rather than happy. It was a productive meeting. It was productively happy. Productively happy is good too. Yes. I thought Tom is going to come up with a with a very good adjective to define World Water Day for us. I think that would be a great idea. Wouldn't that be great as a kind of bucket list tick item? To, to come up with something on World of War today that everybody can get behind. Yesterday, yes. it was about um, the focus was on groundwater, right? Making yes. the invisible visible. To be fair, I, I like that as a catchphrase yeah. from uh, United Nations. That's pretty good, pretty snappy. The question is, do you think if Joe Public walking down the street huh, no. started to care and know about water resources, where the water comes from and groundwater depletion? I mean, arguably that would be the objective of World Water Day to raise awareness, right? It, I, yeah, I, you know, I'm, abs- I, I'm a hydrogeologist. So, you know, I, I think I still understand what groundwater means, but I, I bet that most people believe that the, you know, there are underground streams, you know, floating around and, you know, we've just got straws that go into them. So I don't know. I still think it's a little too geeky in a way. I think people understand. I don't, they don't even know where their water comes from, where it goes, even when it comes from the surface water, <laughs> let alone it's hey, underground. Hey, hey N- N- Nusha, I, you know, I see, I think you're absolutely right. It's like water comes from the tap. What are you talking about? It's sort of like where energy was maybe 10 or 15 years ago, which is energy comes from the socket, you know? Yeah, it, yep. that's kind of it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So are you saying that in 10 years or 15 years, we'll be in a better place? Well, I'm a, you know, I'm a bit of an optimist, Nusha. So sure. I, yeah, I, I think the, 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 sure. the, the no, optimist. No, no, wait, that, that, that could be the, that could be the best comeback ever. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm just asking, you know, it's uh, and, fascinating and, to and, me. And, no, it's, it, you know, it, what I read into that is that, well, you, you continue to be delusional. And, you know, have, and have no, 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 I energy. didn't mean it that way. I didn't mean it that way. But, you know, I think for energy to become a thing and people realizing um, its value, where it comes from, where it goes, and the fact that we, not, we need to invest in it, um, 
it was a multifaceted effort, right? Mm -hmm. So governments got involved, policymakers got involved, decision makers got involved, and eventually they changed a lot of different, a lot of things around energy. And we all started paying attention because your energy bills started changing and we started getting right. apps that tells you how much you're using, how much you're not using. We started getting, uh, you know, advertisement on television that people should wash all their clothes in the washing machine because it uses less energy. So it was just like bombarding people with a lot of information that actually some of it stayed. And that I think really made energy more visible. Do you think though that the reason people talking from a UK context here, have paid more attention to energy is because you mentioned it, with the price going up, the economics is hitting people where it hurts. There's unfortunately going to be a lot of energy poverty. You've got this perfect storm after um, COVID and on, on the UK situation, a lot of smaller suppliers, even my company has gone liquidated, is being propped up by the government. And with the price cap now going up, potentially twice and the price of energy tripling over the space of a couple of years you've got all of that then exacerbate, exacerbated by the ukraine russia situation people start to come aware of in you know um foreign supplies of oil and gas and how that's impacting all of that has driven this public consciousness so the question is what needs to happen for the same thing to happen on water i mean unless you're tripling the price of water and because it's it's very difficult to compare oil and gas to local water supplies so Nusha, what do you is do you think that's what we need in the world of water in terms of a multifaceted outreach, simple narrative to the layperson to help us make that transition? I think for for parts of it, absolutely. I would say, Tom, to your point, um, I think the the um, the change was more than just the price of energy going up. It was also people realizing if you put a solar panel on your roof. Uh, you can generate electricity. So basically all of a sudden they went, I have this terminology called consumer, prosumer, they produce and consume at the same time. Mm -hmm. They sort of switched to that category, which they sort of took energy from the grid, but also produced energy. And, and that by itself, it sort of puts you in a different category. You know how people do uh, sort of... Um, urban farming in their backyard, they grow things, all of a sudden they realize what it takes for you to grow food. That relationship actually really happened for energy. Hasn't happened for water as much. And I would say, um, you know, one other thing that happened in California at least, and eventually it's spread out was we had a lot of blackouts. People respond to these kind of things. If if you all of a sudden start having during the Enron uh, crisis, you know the blackouts starts happening, and people see the energy going out and in, and they don't have electricity coming through their system, and that that is when they start paying attention. Why? Why is that happening? So there was a lot of discussion around there, and that led to policy change, a real policy change that included sort of dismantling our energy sort of um, fundamentals, not from a scientific perspective, but from the institutional perspective and rethinking it and putting it back together. And that definitely changed, the, changed everything for the energy sector, created a market for energy. We started building all these new technologies around energy. Um, uh, we started doing uh, different kind of experimenting with different business models with energy and all mm. of that actually helped the energy sector very much. Hey, Nusha, do you think California is there in terms of a multifaceted approach to communicating the challenges that the state faces with respect to water and um, punctuated by, I, I hate the word crises, but punctuated by Increasing prices, you know, uh, erification, uh, you know, interruptions, fires, things like that. It, it would seem that California has caught up, if you will, in terms of water being a critical issue, just as climate change is. I think we're almost there, I would say. As hmm. long as water is coming out of people's tabs, they don't as much pay attention. I think there's another challenge that we are facing in California. Let's talk about, okay, I'm gonna divide this between the urban and ag communities and not by just saying 
we are different, but but the realities are slightly different, right? Sure. And um, the agriculture community, they depend on water that comes from surface water or underground to be able to function. And if if there's it's a dry year, or if you're and there's no surface water available, or if your well is going dry, and you have to dig a deeper well, or you have to give up your land, it's very much real, right? But from the TAPS perspective, many um, many communities in California have not been experiencing a shut off in it. Okay, yes, they've been shut offs because people are not paid, have not paid their bill, which I think it's ridiculous. But there hasn't right. been like a um, statewide shut off because we have no more water to deliver to people, right? And that it's you know that still sort of keeps people in the sense of abundance. There's always water oh, yeah. it, coming through my tap. It, so yeah. So I, I I love that you use the word abundance. Um, I think it as um, people have perceived abundance as opposed to actual abundance. And oh, yeah, as long as you, and, and to your point, as long as it comes out of the tap, then life must be okay. Well, I mean, should the state just implement periodic shutoffs? <laughs> I mean, look, I think. Um, I would say no, partly because it impacts water quality in the pipes, right? So you don't want to do that. <laughs> but so I, I think the whole um, structured shutoffs is maybe not, not the way to go. But I would say, um, I think another piece of this whole puzzle is the fact that utilities are designed with you know, a lot of massive infrastructure, top-down model, uh, I call it a linear model that brings water from a distance to your home, to your tab, and then takes it away, right? It's like a very much of a linear model. And, um, and then the business model for these utilities often is, a lot of them are municipal utilities, which means they're public utilities, they're not making money, but their business model is to sell water. And that is how they cover the cost of service that they provide to people. And shutting off people or reducing sales or reducing deliveries, it, it hurts their bottom line significantly, or it can hurt their bottom line significantly. So is there an opportunity for decoupling then? I think there is a big opportunity for decoupling. I think California is, I mean, there we have a bill right now going through the legislature uh, looking into this, which is great. Um, I, um, you know, I'm really excited to see because we have been uh, sort of uh, talking about this for the past 10, 10 years or so and seeing seeing it happening in real time is really exciting. But I think utilities at some point re really need to rethink their uh, business model and their rate setting process um, if they want to survive. And if we as, as a state want to survive with this uh, scarcity that we it's very real. So Nusha, you mentioned on the kind of the, <clears throat> I guess the regulatory change that um, disrupted the energy business out of what essentially was an emergency situation. You mentioned about decentralized um, energy solutions in terms of people prosuming and actually exporting back to the grid. So then um, we, we've had conversations before about the role of sort of decentralized water technologies, not only to reduce on the uh, demand side, but also to create more efficient and actually perhaps create a true sense of abundance within properties, within buildings. We've talked about the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco. Where, where do you sort of see decentralized solutions then as part of this shaking up of the business models um, and that mix between centralized and decentralized? Look, I think it's going to be the future. I mean, we are building it right now in San Francisco, but definitely incorporation of these decentralized systems within our existing centralized uh, model, it is going to be the future. And um, while a lot of utilities are resisting it, because if you think about these centralized systems and electric utilities did the same thing, mm -hmm. if you think about this centralized system, what do they do? They basically take part of people's water use off the grid. It's actually, I see it as a demand management strategy which we often don't talk about in the water sector. We right, talk about right. conservation and efficiency all the time. And when you talk about conservation and efficiency, the only way people think about it is it's top down, 
people can, there's only one way of getting water. There's only like five ways of saving water. To your point, just close your tap while you're brushing your teeth or, you know, people have very limited imagination when it comes to water demand and then, and then leaves, right? But when you put a decentralized system in place, let's, I mean, at this point you're talking about a uh, uh, home scale, right? A uh, building scale is centralized, right? That, that means that we are cutting part of the demand and we actually keep regenerating that resource for different needs, right? So that is one way of demand management. Now you can actually scale that up very similar to um, energy or solar panels. You can do it neighborhood level and then you can do mm-hmm. it, um, you know, city level and uh, or you know service area level and a lot of utilities very much hooked on this service area level is recycling because that feeds into their centralized model beautifully right i'm still a generator of resource or producer of resource i put it in my pipes bring it to you because that works for them and i would say that while while we absolutely have to do i think distributed in every scale I would say that should be at the bottom of everybody's bucket. It should start from the top, you know, building level, gray, gray uh, water, mm-hmm. and then and you know, and then you can say stormwater capture, wastewater treatment, and all that would be at the bottom of it. And you know, if you think about buildings, it's just crazy to me that somebody thought, and I can imagine that like hundred years ago, that's how people thought about it, right? But flushing down drinkable water. Like who thought that was a brilliant idea? Oh my God, that is it. Well, it, yes, it's, uh, you know, we flush our toilets with potable water that meet primary drinking water standards. Why right. would you do that? What, you know, you raise a really great question. Why did someone think that was a good idea? Yeah, was I it mean, because... Like, because of the model we had, right? We had this model that we bring, we pipe people, we pipe this water, we pipe people's, you know, wire people's buildings, and then we bring the water and take it away. That was the model we knew. Sure. Nusha, it strikes me, and you and I have talked about this, that, you know, we've got all the technology. Let's just assume we, we hit the pause button on that. What we really need to be focusing on is business model innovation in both the, the private sector, but, you know, certainly in the public sector for utility that, you know, and there, there's a lot of chatter about what does the utility of the future look like? Well, it, it, we know it's not going to look like this because this is a bad idea in the 21st century. So is it that hybrid model where utilities can still get a return on their capital investments and their O&M costs are lower coupled with, um, you know, buildings, neighborhoods, um, being able to be part of that utility in a different way. Absolutely. So, and are, are there good examples of that? Where it's- I think San Francisco comes closest to the reality and partly it's not, you know, partly because we have, we have put in place ordinances that required people doing these kind of things, right? A, uh, very much driven by um, limitations that we have in the downtown area because it's very dense and there's so many uh, construction happening and um, and the, you know people the staff started thinking about the fact that okay we don't have any lots we don't have tons of land there to go mm-hmm. and put a recycling plant so what's the other way of how how else we can approach this let's have these on-site reuse systems. And that's how the ordinances, we had one that was said 250,000 square foot or higher. And now uh, the buildings that are 100,000 square foot or higher have to put in place these uh, on-site reuse systems. I would say when San Francisco did this, I think it was 2012, I would go to these meetings and people would tell me, oh, this model only works for San Francisco, only for San Francisco. There's nobody else. Like how many, I mean, okay, let's say San Francisco, Chicago, New York, like handful of you, you know cities that have this density. But actually I think people really lack imagination because you can do it in your home, 
Like, right. why am I not, you know, my shower is next to my toilet. And almost if you percentage wise, we use the same amount of water in our shower than we use in our toilet. So all you need is a tiny storage and repurposing that water. So. That's a really, really good point then, because you mentioned about, did you call them the ordin ordinances? So that's ordinances. kind of what citywide mandate around a certain geographical area where right. buildings within that site have to reuse. So that was clearly the, the driver, but there is lots of sort of private sector innovation from startups providing the technology to do this. So it needs to sort of come from both angles almost. You need that Absolutely. regulatory, not regulatory, but that sort of authoritative mandate, but then you need the private sector, their innovation to sort of couple in with that as well. Absolutely. And I think that at some point, I want to go back, Will, to your question on the utility, because I don't think I perfectly answered that question, but I think, Tom, to your point here, um, water is a tricky uh, resource. You know, electricity, no matter what you do, um, you're generating the same electron, right? So the quality, there's no difference in quality as much, right? Mm -hmm. But in water, there's difference between quality. So there needs to be a lot of checks and balances put mm -hmm. in place to make sure everything is properly done, people know what they're using for what purpose and to prevent any, um, at least this has been a concern, right? The public health issue, which I think to your point, technologically, we are so advanced at this point that, that something like that would not happen because we can put all the right checks and balances in place to protect right. people. Um, so if you're, if this is not, you know, 1950s, this is not 1920s anymore, right? Which is crazy because we're still building these homes the same way we did build them back then. Right. Um, so, um, so I think that's absolutely correct. It requires more of an imaginative public policy change that would help us to sort of, you know, change our direction and go towards more uh, reuse in different scales. Um, you know, there are people who are very interested in gray water reuse, which is similar to this on-site reuse systems, which is taking water from your tap, from your shower and reuses it for your toilet or your backyard, mostly for backyard uh, use. And there's very limited information for people to go figure out where, how, who would do it. You know, people are constantly confused how they can do such thing right. because it's not easily out there. And I think going back to your comment, Bill, I think this two very nicely connect is utility of the future is gonna be both a provider of the resource, but also sort of taking into that regulatory uh, role in a way too, mm. because you somehow need to make sure that all these checks and balances are in place, people are doing this right and to avoid any mistakes. It, so Nusha, it, the, there's something here. Um, of course there is, but um, could the utility of the future be a service provider beyond water as a resource? So essentially provide the consumer um, uh, with technology solutions, um, you know, certification to some degree, uh, a back office, uh, whatever it may be. I mean, you could you could really sort of expand the role of the utility to include different revenue models beyond just selling a, a gallon or a liter of water and selling services that provide some level of assurance and, and vetting technologies, uh, things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Well, that would, well, why don't we go start one? Yeah, we should. <laughs> well, there we go. You're, you're at Berkeley Labs. Come on. <laughs> Make it happen, Nisha. Come on. <laughs> exactly. Yes, it's on my list, bucket list. Um, <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. I think we need to rethink this business model that we have in so many different ways. And definitely understanding what's the role of utility is key. I think one hinder to this process is um, utilities are still thinking about their future in the model, their existing model. Right. So they're planning for the future thinking, oh, as population grows, demand grows. As economic growth happens, demand grows, which has not been happening at all. Right. Demand has been like flat or dropping, mm -hmm. no right. matter where you're looking. 
and they're still dreaming for that future that this is going to be different and they're still planning for that future they still are looking for the next drop of water they can you know uh, bring in and connect to their water system to bring to people and that actually I think it's a sort of like a suicide note because if you keep yes. building this infrastructure, <laughs> who's going to pay for it, right? If people are going off the grid partially, or if the demand is dropping, you know, everybody talks about all the issues around justice and equity. People who actually do not have resources are going to be the one who are hooked on this because they're not going to be the ones who are going to have resources to put the on-site reuse system, potentially. Right, they'll, they'll be the first movers because just out of necessity, right? But I think yeah. um, just looking at this through a kind of communication lens, if you think about the very word utility, it's very functional, isn't it? We very provide much. you clean water, we take away wastewater, we bill you. I think not only the whole business model and the infrastructure, but even the way that that is phrased and communicated is a very, I don't know, it's, it's almost one way. So I'm not saying... And people often quote, you know, the Uber of an industry. We have to Uber it up and all that, which, you know, starts to get on my nerves a bit. But actually, if you think like <laughs> Uber didn't come along and call themselves the car company or the taxi company. It's a complete rethink on a business model. So it, there, there needs to be some of that in terms of looking at 20, 30 years ahead of what, what a water supply yes. looks like. Yes. What, it, which I they're mean, not. It, so ride sharing, and I won't use the U word. Um, I mean, that delivered mobility, that didn't right. deliver a car. So what, what are we talking about in the water sector that is comparable? Uh, you know, are we, right. I mean, what, you know, what is a utility really delivering and using that as a way to sort of back into what the model looks like? Health, public health. I mean, I think that angle of it, you know, can be explored a bit further. A, a health provider, that would be interesting. I mean, in terms of, you know, healthy hydration and economic health and business health and ecosystem health. Um, societal it, health it, as a whole. Societal health. Tom, I think you're on to something. <coughs> well, I think traditional healthcare is viewed as, you know, go to a doctor or a, or a nurse or a hospital for treatment when you're ill, but actually without clean water, you don't have health to operate an economy a society isn't healthy enough to operate so actually water is key to health but i think until something goes wrong with the water we don't have access to water then the, the whole side isn't questioned so actually some kind of now again i guess we're very early stage brainstorming for the utility of the future that nusha has to go and build <laughs> i thought the three of us doing it together that's oh, no, what I, no, we, will's delegate no we will do it together no we're i'm in tom is in we're, we're in we're, we're in. Yes. Yeah. He's our communication uh, wing. The most yeah. important thing that no utility has. Like they have two people to communicate to the public when the crisis happens, which is <laughs> not a very good strategy. Generally, Man, the mandate is we're not allowed to use the Uber for water. That's kind of the one one rule. No, no, no. <laughs> no, but, but I, I, think, but I think that health I say, angle is yeah. I think one other way of thinking about it. I think mobility, not using the word, the U word. Uh, mobility was a very interesting way of sort of approaching yes. um, that, that process. Think about water, actually, I would say, um, you know, we also have these buckets, right? People do water supply and then they take wastewater and then they do storm right. water and they're not under the same umbrella. And the reality is if you think about this as one cycle, your business model changes totally as well because all of a sudden, you are not just in the business of bringing water to people, you're also managing the back end of that thing, which is, you know, where the water is going. And also, you have to think about how stormwater, which now is treated as a nuisance, like can be reused for different, <laughs> like, seriously, all of a sudden, you're basically much more holistic versus, you know, bucket, 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 and, and your products are going to diversify in a way too, right. if you're not just doing one thing. So that, this is a great conversation because it's headed somewhere. Um, in, in terms of 
yes, we, we can actually imagine what this might look like by abandoning, in quotes, where, you know, where we started, you know, your whole point about, yeah, we use potable water to flush toilets. Well, okay, we get that off the table, so to speak. But I mean, what you're pointing out is really interesting that in a more expansive view, there are other opportunities for revenue that are more sustainable and more resilient in the face of the realities that we face right now, you know, including climate change and, you know, aging infrastructure and demographics, um, you know, the whole digital transformation and, you know, enabled things like new mobility and, you know, education and even healthcare. Yeah. Um, remote working. So, yeah, there, there's definitely something here, just blank sheet of paper. What could it look like? I think, you know, like going back to the same conversation, another thing is think about like all these cities we are building right now. Every day we are building all these subdivisions. They're building them the oh. same exact way. And actually I was reading some a piece a friend is writing for um, Circle of Blue. And he was mentioning how parts of Phoenix, north of Phoenix now, they're cut off from the uh, centralized water system because there's no water to be delivered to them. And they're not letting them to get tanker water either. So wow. this is, you know, this is real for some communities and sort of what does that mean and how you can rethink that by itself? Like why would you build like Phoenix in all places, build them the same way that we did before, right? So I think the opportunity area also, I mean, I think, the opportunity is sort of um, to get rid of the fragmentation across business, business, the business of water. So create this, you know, I know this one water concept is such an uh, important topic. A lot of people are working on it, but it is like real having utilities that focus on water as a whole. And then also think about what is your relationship with growth, right? Land use change and growth and how we want actually that to look very different from what looks mm -hmm. right right now. Um, which is something we are not really doing. Um, this, is not, this is not my stats, so I'm going to repeat it. I might, it might not be absolutely accurate, but I heard somewhere that um, I think every day we build as like a, a Manhattan worth of buildings in the U.S., so like every day, wow. and imagine every day we are building them the same exact way we have done 50 years ago, 80 years ago. And all these buildings are gonna last another 50 to 100 years. Mm -hmm. So we are not really helping ourselves. We have to literally like take a side road and rethink, which we're right. not doing. Right. Unless you're building them as water efficient, sustainable houses at scale that will last and it's actually with technology of the future. Yeah. But this, um, but if you think we've, we've asked this question, but imagine if you could build from scratch a water utility and one of our sort of fellow colleagues from a, we will sit on a the advisory board of a startup, but what they're doing, Gavin Von Tonda, what he's doing in Neom in Saudi Arabia, which is, you could say is an exception. Um, but actually in terms of writing their own regulation, building a network with no loss, building a digitalized network from scratch, I think is perhaps one of the most exciting water utility projects in the world right mm. now. It's really, I mean, he can look at what's going on around the world and have this conversation, but actually with the budget to make it happen. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I put a... A, uh, a pin in the balloon? <laughs> I'm saying you're absolutely right. They have that chance. The only problem with that project is they're still focusing on abundance. Because they, you know, they there's still this whole concept of there's enough water out there to bring to this it, place, right, right. and I'm gonna so, go bring it. Right, it's the supply side solution. Very much supply side solution, but you're it, absolutely right. It, go ahead. Well, I I think we're all played by that. You know the, you know again the American West is this classic example of oh my goodness there's no surface water how do I get more as opposed right. to how do I use less and or rethink how I'm using in different right. ways. Yeah, exactly. So, right. you know, how do I develop, you know, products that don't use water or use less water, whatever it may be, you know, and, and getting to the built environment piece of the puzzle. Um, 
I, you know, it, it, one of the themes of the stream is, you know, I, challenging the status quo and the built environment and, you know, utilities are still very much stuck in the status quo because that's how they've always done it. Um, yeah. And it's very hard to, it's like this massive giant thing that you have to sort of break it, apart and put it back together and no one knows what to do. <laughs> right. Right. It's, we got asked this question on a panel yesterday, Will. Is is there an example? I mean, I think you talked about it from San Francisco, Nisha, but is there an example of anyone that is doing all of these different things well? And my response was not really. You've got pockets of these right. lighthouses of innovation, right. stuff happening in Singapore and Israel and California to England, but actually someone who's bringing them all together from the clean and to the wastewater side and the digital right. side, it doesn't really exist just yet. No, well, I, I, yeah, go ahead, Bill. No, no, you, you finish. No, I was just trying to say that uh, I think on the built environment side, the 50 liter homes is like the yeah. closest you can get to the concept, still right. not a right. actuality, but sort of trying to kind of create a movement towards this. And I would say um, Denmark, you know, has definitely tried a um, uh, to kind of bring their water use down. They're still not in a whole circular economy on, on, uh, on water, but, um, but they def definitely have tried to become uh, digitized and become more efficient uh, when it comes to water. But I, I, I agree with you. I don't think there's any good model out there that you say they're doing it from A to Z and doing right. it well. Yeah. Hey, you know, I'm going back to the built environment. Um, when I had Damani pre-Deloitte days, we had a, a green building practice when uh, lead certification was really just beginning uh, to launch. And in, in, in the UK, it was Bream. Um, and water was just not a factor in lead certification. Now they, they've, they've moved to a point where water suddenly has a place in a, in quotes, green building. Um, but there's a lot more work to be done. And, you know, it's interesting talking to clients that have retail space and, and commercial space. They are looking to reduce their water footprint. And I mean, it, it, it's not a, a big footprint. It's really kind of de minimis in the scheme of things. But redirecting them towards look at the green building standards. You don't have to be certified, but start applying technologies, you know, like air moisture capture, water conservation, you know, water reuse into your building as a way to drive acceleration and adoption of those technologies and, and rethink the built environment. I, it, it's really an interesting uh, conversation and potential in the marketplace. Absolutely. I mean, think about all these uh, warehouses or places that people go, Targets and Walmarts and Costco's. Tom, you don't have the, all, the, all these glorious stores there, I guess. So if you want, we can take you on a tour when you come here for a visit. Uh, but you know, they, they all have bathrooms and people use those bathrooms, right? And they all, you know, they, they can be rewired, um, but we are not doing that. And a lot of people use those facilities um, or they, you all have HVAC systems that they can potentially reuse the water that are being used within them. So there's, there are things that they can do but again, the opportunity is there. I'm not sure that many people are seizing that opportunity because it's not required to your point. Well, think yeah. about um, the impact of COVID on kind of city center traffic, traffic and actually how a lot of department stores are having to rethink their business models to turn them into apartment blocks and houses and flats yeah. and actually just can fundamentally rethink the retail model. So. Yeah, it's this is a really uh, amazing conversation. I feel like we could we could probably carry on for a lot longer in terms of what is the future, what does a future water utility look like? So, um, Anusha, we are sort of at that magic time, um, which has absolutely flown by. I don't think we've covered any of the points. I think we'd hope to in the talking voice, but it doesn't matter because this has been <laughs> this has been amazing, absolutely amazing. So, I really appreciate that. Was Bill's fault because he didn't want to follow that? You remember. <laughs> it, 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 Tom knows by now it's it's usually my fault um you know I, I'm the guy that like yeah okay we got to edit well out 
you know. Not, that not, not at all. Things. It's like the status quo would be to follow the talking points, right? That we have. So we, we don't do right. that. We don't, there you go. So we break the status quo. But thanks for putting them together. <laughs> <laughs> the effort was appreciated, right? Yes. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Um, Anusha, just listen. Uh, sorry, Anusha, thanks, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And um, Will, any final comments I, from you? But of course, Tom, and, and, you know, not that we have a prep call, but, you know, when we had our, our, our pre-stream call, both of you brought up something that was new to me. I always learn. And it was that reference to TikTok, how TikTok videos of, you know, some kid taking um, goo the, out of the a slime and slime and playing with it. Well, oh my God, he went up you went slime. and got some slime. Wow. I have, I have to tell you that this is transformative for me. <laughs> it, it, it's really, it, it's, it's a total stress reliever and it smells so nice. So um, I'm hoping that me with this little ball of scented goo propels the stream to fame like that TikTok video. And Nucha, uh, you know, and, and Tom, uh, thank you. Thank you, That's Will, I... for trying that. That's, now I feel so much more comfortable. The uh, pressure is off me and on your goo, right? <laughs> I feel, I feel like that we should do a couple of edits of the stream. One is just Will playing with the goo or unboxing. That thing is going to go viral, right? Million, I mean, I look at the, the videos my children watch of the, the goo opening and the goo building. You're talking millions and millions of views. So the potential's there, right? Yeah, Will with goo on his hands. And you know, now you've got to take it off. And, and, and Tom, you can take a snippets of our conversation and put it on top of the goo uh, demonstration and imagine how many people are going to listen and pay attention to it hey we can come back to you know getting more attention world war today happy utility of the future wills goo i mean this this thing's got endless it, it, potential endless potential it, I, I like one request I, I would not phrase it as wills go if, if, you, <laughs> if you don't mind i just think that's yeah, as the communic as a communicator, yeah, we will definitely rethink that. It's time for a, a coffee. I, I, thank I you, Tom. That. Very Listen, much thank appreciate you. it. Anisha, thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for the, the time and the, the brilliant discussion. Really appreciate thank it. You we, so uh, we'll much. catch up fun. with you uh, very shortly. Sounds good. Good to see you both. All right. Take care. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.